Hi, everyone, and uh, welcome to Hospitality Association's uh, Phase 2 Reopening Checklist. Our webinar today is, uh, I'm your host, Ken Wells, with the Washington Hospitality Association in Business Development. And we're here to support our members in getting operational ready to reopen in Phase 2. Joining me today on the panel of our industry experts, all having in one form or another experience with health department requirements. Uh, first, let me introduce Todd France, a senior technical consultant with UL Everclean Solutions. Uh, Todd's expertise started uh, with the health department in San Bernardino, California, and a wealth of industry experience, including 14 years with Walt Disney Company as Principal Food Safety and Public Health Manager and consulting with USA, ID, and private agencies outside of the United States. Say hello, Todd. Uh, also with me is Mike Holler, is the Technical Manager for UL Everclean. He served as a Program Manager for Orange County, California Environmental Health Food and Pool Safety Program, one of the toughest counties in the country. Uh, where he oversaw a team of 105 field inspectors and 12 supervisors for the past 12 years of his 25-year career. Say hello, Mike. Good morning, everyone. Glad to be here. And then that, last but not least, our own Samantha Lauterbach with the Washington Hospitality Association State Government Affairs Senior Manager. Uh, Samantha leads the association's efforts on policy that relates to the environment, food safety, human trafficking, prevention, workforce development, and an assortment of other business issues. Her list goes on. She also is the lead on expert on all things regarding the Department of Health and rep represents the association on several statewide uh, stakeholder groups. Say hello, Samantha. Good morning. So our webinar today is preparing to reopen our in-house dining in phase two after COVID. Uh, the topics we'll be discussing today are equipment and facilities, our employee, employee training, health and safety, PPE sanitation plans, uh, and customer protection, social distancing. But first, before we get started, let me thank you all for doing really your part to reduce COVID-19. Uh, Washington State is using a phased approach to reopen the established uh, on-site dining. Uh, this it's been closed by the, by the governor's stay home, stay healthy order. Once the county is approved to enter phase two, food establishments that closed their kitchens or dining areas should use the following checklist when reopening during phase two. And just a reminder in phase two, you have 50% of your total building occupancy, no more than 50%, and then table size limit is a five or less, no bar seating. Um, and then uh, and then the, the ones that are open uh, right now, um, I'm not sure if Matt can push the slide there. I don't, I don't have the button for that, but we have some counties that are already open. And uh, Matt, if you can uh, uh, show the slide on that, I'm not uh, able to see the slide. So you're gonna have to show slides as we go along. Um, our checklist is available on the hub. It's a, uh, hub.wahospitality.org. So that's hub.wahospitality.org. And all you have to do is put in the research of reopening and you'll get two things that will come up that I think will help you out a lot. One is the COVID-19 food establishment pre-opening checklist. And then the other is the Washington State uh, Guide to Reopening Your Restaurant. Uh, Todd, um, when, when you answer, don't forget to unmute on your side. Uh, but first, we're going to go through equipment and physical structure. Um, Mike, let me start with you, if you don't mind. Uh, sure, Ken. Making, making sure your utilities are working, like electrical, plumbing, you know, those kind of things. Uh, can you talk about that just a little bit? Sure, absolutely. So, um, you know, not knowing whether how long your your uh, facility has been down, um, it, it's really really vital to make sure that there's some things, some of the pieces of equipment are up and running and are able to get flushed through. For instance, 
making sure all your electrical, plumbing, heating, ventilation, air conditioning, and fire suppression systems are all current and up to date. Um, and if you have a water system that has been, been in a static condition, to make sure all that gets run through and that the plumbing is all working and everything. Um, and uh, even things like your grease trap can, um, you know, that has not had its normal flow through, um, it, that, that grease, if it hasn't been serviced in a while, uh, this is a good time to do it because as it hardens up with uh, the decreased flow of water going through it, um, it could cause you some problems um, systematically through your sewer system. Um, you know, also making sure and uh, assessing your food that may have been left over, you know, if it's been, if it's been in there for a while, checking the dates. Um, there is a great great uh, website at the uh, USDA that has Food Keeper. It's an application that you can put on your phone. It's free. And that Food Keeper has all the different dates and expirations uh, for things like pasta to baby food. Um, so you can find out good information on that. Um, and, and also um, making sure that you've had a good walkthrough of the facility to check on pests because that has been one of those things that have gone viral on YouTube is seeing some of the uh, facilities that have been shut down, but vermin do not take the day off. So uh, uh, making sure that it's properly assessed and, uh, and make sure you're standing tall for when inevitably you're going to get a health inspection uh, come through, you wanna be standing tall. Mike, let me go back just for a second, and these are all great points, but, you know, uh, getting through all the electricity, I think a lot of people forget about things like ventilation, air conditioning, make sure they're fired up. Your fire suppression is also, uh, when was the last time that it was serviced, et cetera, because you've been down for a couple of months, and you might, be, you might need to be due with that as well. Um, the other thing is when you mentioned about flushing everything out, you know, how long should you flush your water pipe systems and your plum food? Um, for a water system, for a water system, uh, typical that has been set, sitting in the, the, uh, the pipes and it's been static, um, I would give it at least 10 minutes of, you know, flushing it through both the hot water and the cold water. And um, that can uh, rid your pipes of anything that has been in static. Um, static water has an ability to attract things like Legionella um, and, uh, and other, you know, um, things that uh, like, like the, the metal inside the pipes and everything like that as well, the copper ion. So you want to give right. that a good flushing to make sure that any of the static water that's been sitting in there has been thoroughly flushed through. But 10 minutes is very adequate. You know, as you talk about flushing water and, and, and one of the top things that's come up is, is ice machines, right? Mm -hmm. and, and I have a question. Um, so I understand, you know, everyone understands running faucets to clear pipes of Legionnaires bacteria, but how does one safely uh, recommission their ice machine? And that's, a, that's an excellent question. So um, most of the water um, or the, the ice machines, if they have an inline filter, this would be a great time to change out that inline filter um, and making sure that that is, uh, is nice and clean and flushed out. You can go ahead and run a couple batches of ice through it, take all the ice out and drain it and then clean and sanitize uh, afterwards. And when I'm saying clean and sanitize, I mean go in through the housing and up into the chute and making sure that's all clean and sanitized um, and making sure there's no visible signs of mildew or mold that are in any of the inside surfaces. And then remember to uh, make sure you um, wipe that out really, really well with a clean dry rag and stuff. And, and uh, you, can, uh, you can then start up the machine and start um, manufacturing ice again. Yeah, I would say what's real important for our folks to know out there is to understand what ice machine you have. Look up the recommendations from them as well. I mean, a lot of them have wash buttons, right? I mean, that's, you know, depends on, you know, how, how uh, what type of machine you have. I'll make sure that on the hub we have um, cleaning, uh, basically some cleaning guidelines for that. I came across some 
uh, over the weekend, and I thought they would be perfect to help those members that are asking that question. Because uh, the bottom line is, is that at the end of the day, uh, that is one of the areas that could uh, get people sick. You want, you know, you want to make sure that they're up and running, and maybe uh, taking a little extra TLC on preparing that would be important. Um, Mike, what, why I got you on here? Um, um, we talk about our dish machines, right? So the low temp, high temps. You know what's needed there. Um, for the dish machines, you want to make sure that uh, again you want to look at the expiration dates. If any expiration dates exist on your chemical um, sanitizers, uh, to make sure that they're still within uh, a, in a tolerable range and a tolerance range, and then um, so they can be effective, and then making sure that your your uh, your condition of the the machine is in good condition. Do a visual inspection. Make sure there is no corrosion or, you know, the buildup of the salts, uh, depending on your water condition in your area, to make sure that everything's running. And then run it through at least four or five times to prime up the system and make sure that all the gauges are working correctly and that they're, uh, you've got your test strips to make sure that you've got effective sanitizer at the end of your cycle of those dish machines. For the hot water, it's the exact same thing. Check and make sure on the gauges that you're hitting a plate contact. You can uh, either get the little strips that go onto the plate or you can look at the manifold. So at the plate contact, it's 160, 160 degrees, or at the manifold, it's 180 degrees. So that would mean that your dish machine, your high temp is working very, very well. Right, right. And one other thing I want to remind people is, you know, we'll go through, we'll clean our lines, but we forget about our soda machines. Most of us, you know, we'll, we'll, we think about our beer tabs, but, you know, sometimes having someone come in and flush out those beer tabs is important, uh, as well as our wine tabs, because at the end of the day, you're, this is like a new opening. I mean, it's like you're opening up a new restaurant, but yet you've had some some stuff, I mean, basically, you know, it's been sitting in there for two months without use. And you've got to make sure that your lines are not just, you know, you're not serving old product, but at the same time that it's clean. Um, the, the other thing you mentioned was about discarding old food. I think one of the things we all think about is once in our refrigerator and stuff like that. But at this point, this is one where we need to check what's on the shelf because we've had stuff that we've been saving for two months and even though, you know, it's only been two months at the end of the day, some of those dry goods could be uh, could be outdated. Is that not the case? That is absolutely true. And depending on the weather conditions in inside, if it's been hot or, you know, it's been unusually um, has high humidity, then you want to check those products visibly to see if uh, they're still in code for one and that they're in good condition. Uh, is is absolutely necessary, Ken. Agreed, totally agree. Um, okay, so we talk about those things, you know, equipment and stuff, restarting, you know, so we obviously, when we think about restarting our utilities, we've also got to restart uh, our other services, uh, things like pest control, trash, and recycling services. Now, now, Mike, let me ask you another question. One thing we, we don't think about is about the cleaning surfaces, okay? I mean, it's, you know, well, typical we think about the counters and sometimes the high touch areas, but what about the rest of our building? Yeah, no, uh, Ken, it's a very good point to do a visual inspection is really, really important to make sure that uh, your vermin control, your building is basically, you want to build things out of your, uh, of your, of your, of your uh, inside establishment. So, making sure that uh, you know the, the, the gaps are all sealed up, that there is no harboring area for pests uh, and no entryways for the pests to get into your facility because it has been down. It could be down as much as two months and a lot can change. Even the vegetation outside of the facility might need to be trimmed back or cut back to normal levels. So uh, a good visual inspection to make sure that uh, there are no harboring areas for pests, especially. That's going to be an imminent health hazard for any health department um, is looking at the vermin. Okay. Now, you know, Mike, I didn't mean to get stuck on you here, but uh, but Samantha, uh, Todd, don't forget to unmute yourself, Todd. 
Uh, anything else we're missing that uh, that we should be covering here when we talk about equipment and physical structure? You know, Ken, I'm going to add one more thing here um, for the uh, employees. A lot of their food safety certificates may have uh -huh. uh, come up or expired. So you want to go ahead and make sure that the uh, the um, your your certifications for food safety manager and your food handlers, if you have those in the, the counties uh, that you have up there, um, that they that they are in in uh, they're still they're still good. Okay. All right. You know, you, you might also just look at the commonplace things that are just everyday occurrences that haven't been used, like your soap, towel, paper towel, sinks, right? It's just the basic stuff stocked. Right, right. I know we're going to talk about sanitizer and some of this other stuff, you know, coming up. Um, let me kind of switch hats here uh, just for a second, um, or not for a second, but l l let me move on here to a, a, another uh, section. Uh, employee training, health and safety. Um, that whole, you know, PPE section, sanitation plans, et cetera. Todd, let me start with you. Uh, develop employees, uh, I mean, illnesses, policy and procedure. Is that something we need to be doing when we start to, I mean, we're starting over here, right? Yeah. So what would you make that suggestion to get employees kind of trained and, and, and prepared for this? You know, I think it's important to be able to emphasize what you're already doing, right? We all, as food operators, you already have food code requirements for not working when ill. And so you can now add a layer onto that of the additional um, symptoms that are associated with, with COVID. And so the, the trick is to have the policy, the procedures that'll work for you and that you can actually implement. That's, that's kind of the broken record on all the presentations and webinars that I'm doing. Um, don't go too elaborate. Don't find the most, uh, you know, complex thing out there, but look for uh, the basic procedure. If you're able to do, you're planning on doing screening for employees before the shifts, put that in the policy um, and, and just have the basic requirements in, in place before you get started. Um, it's, you know, it, again, if you make it too complex, it's not going to work. And so stick to the basics, you know, is it screen? Do we have fevers? Have you, um, you know, if you've been excluded, um, have the procedures in place so that the employees know up front and are trained, when can they come back and how long do they need to be excluded? These are all really key things. Um, the, the personal protective equipment, you know, have that spec'd out in advance, have the expectations called out so that um, if you're, you know, whatever you're providing in terms of face coverings, gloves, barriers, make sure that that stuff is all broken down. And I would have that covered in my training so that these are things that are different, right? This is stuff that's a little bit not, not what we're used to doing in food facilities. And so have those items in particular um, called out specifically. So, um I want to just point out, let's try and train our employees on the language they can understand, right? So so let me point Absolutely. that out. But one, develop employees illness policy and procedures. So the illness policy and procedures, what I heard you say. Um, not only that, but the the um, proper cleaning, sanita sanitation, and, disin and disinfection procedures. Even though a lot of those might be the past ones, right, that we've always operated on, it's, right. re it's reinforcing those. Um, em employee safety, I mean, when you think about health and safety of the COVID-19, how to prevent transmission, required hand uh, hygiene, illnesses reporting requirements. So there's a lot wrapped in, uh, wrapped up to what you're mm -hmm. saying here, right? Um, Absolutely. Yeah, I, I think that that's real important to slow down and absorb this a little bit because uh, that's what I think the checklist will do is making sure that you know, you're really going through and setting up your your uh, your processes because there are new processes here that's taking place, whether, again, you're back at your facilities or now you're starting to look at your employee, their training, their health, their safety. So uh, written procedures, uh, it sounds like to me that we want to have that also in our, in our physical distance. Go ahead. Oh, I just wanted to add that the association, just so everyone knows, the association not only has developed this checklist with the, the partnership with the Department of Health, but we also have developed a draft policy for your uh, business to use as a template. And then you can add those specific items, uh, for instance, employee illness policies 
to this plan that can be found on the hub as well. So the association has, has started to do that for you because it is a task. And so all you'll need to do is go in and really uh, create, specify it for, for your business. It's fantastic to not have to reinvent the wheel. You know, take the resources that are available and customize them so they fit for you. Right, 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 right. So, okay. Uh, let's talk about some employee, uh, some employee health and safety a little further than just the training. Uh, let's talk about the social distancing there. Uh, sure. Do we want to write procedures out for that, Todd? Yeah, I mean, every every point where you're going to have a, a specifically socially distanced requirement in your procedure needs to be documented. And that starts actually from the very front of the house where, um, you know, guests might be queuing up to enter the restaurant. What is your, um, what's your plan? What are your distances? What are your markers? What are your indicators to be able to keep guests and parties, I should say, um, separated from the very get-go out in the front uh, to being seated. Um, who does the seating and um, how do you do the seating? Is it done in shifts? Most of the jurisdictions are recommending now that you would seat one party at a time so that you don't have parties crossing paths as you go back and forth, guest parties. Um, even things along the lines of if you're going to be installing any barriers, uh, the plexiglass barriers are becoming pretty commonplace. Um, or if you actually are using something else besides a plexiglass barrier, such as something to create distance, have right. the employees understand that that setup is there to create the social distance. It's not just um, a setback for some other purpose. And I think a lot of our conversation that we've had prior to getting on the webinar here was what about the back of the house? I mean, I know we all think of front of the house, but you know, I got a small kitchen yep. and, um, and this is going to affect my ability to, you know, produce. Yeah. The back of the house can get very tricky because you get confined spaces happening and, um, and everybody's close together. So the, the, the key thing, you know, when that's feasible is to maintain the six feet. Can you restructure? Can you take something that was, in the back of house space, but maybe a, a counter service or a service plane. And can you move that out to where uh, self-service used to be, but is no longer occurring? So that, that frees up the space. So really think creatively about your back of house space and, and, and think of things. Does this still need to be back of house? Or can we use, can we expand our prep areas into places that previously might have been a counter setup staging area that can be moved somewhere else? Um, and you know when it comes down to the actual scheduling of shifts it's very difficult to be able to say okay shift a is all scheduled shift b is scheduled shift c is going to be scheduled and we won't have those people overlapping um, but i know that we've talked with a lot of clients where they when they didn't do that and and now you had one person who had interacted with multiple shifts and suddenly when they tested positive the entire facility the entire crew went down um, so you have to consider those again, this is that thing, what's going to work for you. Um, if you can limit the amount of exposure by staggering your shifts, uh, a lot of jurisdictions are strongly recommending that as well. All right. So that takes me back to employee and symptoms and, and things like that. And, and I, I, I'm not walking away from social distancing here for the kitchen. Cause I know there's more to discuss about that, but sure. you know, if, um, yeah, should I be screening employees and, 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 and if I'm screening employees, should I write those procedures down? Yeah, really, really common. Uh, I mean, that, that's, that's becoming the best practice. That's, that's very commonplace is each procedure, each employee coming in, what you have to avoid is asking any HIPAA related questions. Things are going to violate uh, it, it, any personal health data, but you can have them sign an, an attestation or an affidavit that says, here's, here's the symptoms that I can't have while I'm working. And I testify that I'm good with those. Um, and then the other thing is a screening for temperatures is something that we can do pass fail. You're, you're good to work or not, um, as a physical thing in, in the moment as well. And I would have those written down. I'd have the, have the steps called out employees. You, you check in, which door do you check in now? If everybody's used to just filtering in through front door, back door, side door, you know, have them and think about the queuing when you're waiting, because you might have an entire shift start at the same time. Well, now they need to not congregate while they're waiting to get into the location. So it does uh, it, it does make you think about a whole lot of different uh, elements to how you've built your business. 
Well, when I think of employee uh, screening in the aspect are uh, no different than I have in the past. I mean, I've got to make sure that my employees are prepared for work. And part of that is making sure that they're not ill, that, you know, I mean, yeah. if I'm serving alcohol, I mean, in the aspect that everybody is, you know, is, is all in and all there. Um, I think I had to do that in the past. So I still got to do that in the future. But I need to maybe pay a little bit more attention to the health of my employees where in the past, maybe I wasn't as observant, but today I think if I'm suspecting some of that, I need to talk to that employee, maybe one-on-one -on -one away from everybody else just to make sure they're safe. Sam, any comments in this particular area? Yeah, Ken, I think that our industry um, and our industry's employees are already required to disclose if they have a number mm -hmm. of symptoms due to food safety and food health uh, outbreaks and contamination. And so this is just a really important step that the person in charge will have to take to ensure that all employees are trained on these new symptoms. And if they feel like um, sick or have, a, have had a fever, these are the things that they're going to need to uh, better understand and continue to disclose like a food safety employee or a food employee is supposed to do already. Okay. I want to talk just a little bit about the kitchen because I know this would be as an operator who's operated for 30 years in this business, probably one of the most frustrating for me is me, my small kitchens, <laughs> right? And the fact that I've gotten, um, um, you know, I, production, right? So I, I know we talked about, you know, we had a webinar on menu a couple or on menus a couple weeks ago about re-engineering those. And I think some questions are going to come up this. I know they're we're going to come up here in a minute because I, I see some of them coming up already. Um, but uh, when I look at that on the back of the line, I think I've got to be creative, Todd. Is that not the case? I mean, maybe I've got equipment in the corner, a, a, a fryer or something like that, where that person just needs to stay there and, and work that fryer and not be doing crossing and doing other duties. And, and so, so let me bring that up before you respond. Also, if I ask back there, you know, can you respond a little bit about some of the kitchen conditions? Sure. I, I mean, just remember that, um, you know, the exposure is is both time and distance related. So, uh, you know, food facilities, we're used to time and temperature already. So think of time and distance both. Crossing paths is not necessarily an exposure. Working side by side for a period of time is. So what you said is that if you can distance and create a workstation that's in the back corner so that person stays there and this person is in a workstation here, that's going to help minimize that time exposure. The masks are huge. Um, and, and think of it in terms of, um, you know, there's not a one size fits all. And, and I've, as I've heard a lot of conversations, there's been frustrations with people in the back of house where it's hot and they don't want to wear that mask. And, and just remember that there, there are more than one type of mask out there. And they're trying to force a particular type of mask that doesn't work for everybody. So, um, you know, you, there, there's a wide variety available. Cloth, we're still recommending let the medical masks be stuck with the medical professionals. So N95s, leave, the, leave that for our medical supply. But beyond that, there are plenty of masks designed with a little extra uh, face, facial area in front of the mouth so that you're not, it doesn't cut right across your, and touch your lips and everything as you're talking. That seems to be a very common bothering point. Um, and make sure that, you know, whatever you're using, it's, there's some input from that from your employee. The other thing is some employees actually have pre-existing conditions where wearing a mask is not medically feasible for them. And uh, what most of our clients and jurisdictions have been allowing is to, to say, if you have a note from your doctor that says you cannot wear that mask, uh, then go with that, which is probably a policy you already have in place for any uh, prescription in your policy that requires a PPE and there's an employee with a medical restriction on that, I would let the doctor make that choice um, and, and, and let them sign off on it. You know, Todd, just read through, I think, one of the questions that was coming up here. I see the everything, you know, kind of kind of moving here on questions real fast on some that were submitted in, in writing. Um, and that's one of them was that whole entire, you know, uh, what do I do if there's a respiratory issues in the back? The key there is having that 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 medical waiver, so to speak, from their doctor. Right. 
Uh, the other thing is, and, uh, and this is Samantha. I, I think it's really important to, to yes, that is uh, an important factor. However, labor and industries have been very specific on everyone needing to wear a face mask, and so right. before moving forward with that, I would definitely call labor and industries before just allowing a doctor's note to be okay. I think also something that's um, not been stated here is that LNI is asking us that our employees are six working within six feet apart. And with not feasible, we need to come up with solutions for, um, for barriers. And so yes, staggering shifts and locations, but really ensuring that you have a barrier, plexiglass, ensuring there's extra PPE equipment. But I think that's really important to state. And I see one of the questions here talking about face shields. Face shields, um, according to L and I, are not okay to be used by themselves. You can use a mask and a shield, but a face shield does not protect the employee um, completely. So those would need to be used as something else. I'm going to add one more thing those here as well, um, just about the the face mask. And we, I think we've all been seeing it where reporters or anything they yeah. they have it up. And they're constantly it. adjusting it because it's not the right fit. Um, I'm really, really concerned about where people are constantly, if, you, if, if you're the PIC, if you're the person in charge and you see one of your staff constantly touching their face, that's what you don't want to do. So making sure that that is a proper fit so it doesn't keep falling down and that it's fitted uh, properly is going to be uh, the biggest challenge, I think. Well, Bingo. plus that introduces now new needs for just basic food safety hand washing, right? Because now I've touched my face and I'm doing that and I've got something in play that wasn't in play before we went, before we closed off before COVID. So it, it just drives, some of this stuff just drives the normal food safety practices. Um, it has to make you even rethink those. Yeah. Samantha, I think you made one of the best points is the, uh, the barriers in the back. All of us operators are thinking of the barriers in the front, but we're not recognizing the fact that we can have some of that in the back as well. And uh, that can make it a lot easier for our employees. Um, let's move on to the next topic, um, uh, and then we can uh, answer some questions. Uh, um, uh, before we do, there is one question back on employee and training. Um, so... Will L and I require PPE for workers in phase four? Samantha, do you know whether that whether they'll require that or not? That that's not something that we're gonna know until we get to phase four. Um, L and I is ensuring that employees are as safe as possible, and so until we start to reopen and, and make our way through the phases, I, I think that 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 answer will come later. By then, we'll probably be pretty experienced on it. Um, and then the other thing I want to bring up to everybody that will use that are thinking of using gloves, that gloves is not going to replace hand washing. So at the end of the day, yep. you, you might be one that want to use those, you know, those those uh, disposable gloves. That's fine. You can use disposable gloves. But remember, you might have to wash those or change those often because at the end of the day, uh, that's not necessarily going to protect someone if they're not following safety procedures. Okay. And remember that we've got we've now introduced gloves as a personal protective equipment where we weren't using them that way before. And so a front of house cashier who's using a glove to protect them as the wearer is very different than a food handler in the back of house who's wearing that glove to protect the food they're handling. And and that actually for a lot of the facilities and a lot of our clients we've worked with has been a, a little bit of mental gymnastic and they get kind of confused because uh, those two different purposes are fairly distinct. And, right. and Ken, I'm going to add as a former inspector, I used to tell operators, you never ever will get in trouble for washing your hands too much. Yeah. And uh, that has never been truer now. So wash the hands, wash the hands, wash the hands. It's the totally most great. important thing that you can do. Okay. Got to move on guys. Customer protections and social distancing. All right. Uh, Samantha, um, develop written procedures here, or you know, what what do we do? 
Yeah, uh, the Department of Health would like it to be a written procedure. This was something that we worked with them on. This isn't a gover uh, governor mandate, but through the Department of Health, uh, they would just like to ensure that the person in charge is well equipped in understanding what the facility's plan is. And so with that uh, template that the association has provided and uh, created, this would be something that would be this would be something I'm sorry, I'm getting a lot of feedback. Does anyone else? Yeah. Okay. Um, and so uh yeah, it would be it would be something as easy as when guests come in, this is how the, the front um handles folks or having markers on the ground uh for folks to understand that uh six feet apart is definitely needed when entering the lobby. Okay, so um, and also the limit of occupancy at 50%. Now, does that also include outside dining? Typically outside dining has its own capacity. Therefore, so if you have a uh, an outside patio, it has its own capacity. So 50% of the outdoor patio and then 50% of the inside occupancy. They do not count as one, they are separate. And Samantha, when people think of six feet, there's been a lot of questions about six feet from chair to chair, from table to table. Help me measure the six feet when it comes to my dining room. Yeah, the governor has requested that uh, we measure from occupied chair to occupied chair. And so if you have a guest sitting back to back, you need to make sure that that occupied chair at the guest behind them is six feet apart. Um, again, this they have allowed us to, uh, it allowed to use a barrier. So if you have a booth, you can put uh, barriers like plexiglass in between. So you can use those booths um, to ensure people are social distancing, but it is important to, um, to separate your tables. Okay. And I know this question could be a repeat of what you've already done in a previous webinar, but if I do have booths, can I use all those booths? How high do I need to go up to protect those booths and try to maximize my seating? I don't think we know a specific height. That's not guidance, but I think uh, it would be smart for an operator to stand there, stand next to the, the booth and, and, and see how tall it should be, right? You really want, unfortunately, we really want to enclose our guests into that specific area if you're going to use back-to-back -back booths for everyone's safety. So that could be six, seven feet high. I mean, the bottom line is I've got to be person high because someone could get up at the next table. Um, okay. Um, posted signage, um, recommendations to wear face masks. What's required, Samantha? Yeah, so it, um, we've been asked to remind guests to wear face masks when not seated. Uh, please stay uh, six feet apart. Continue to wash your hands. And so the association has provided and created all of these these documents you can see on the right here that would be easy to print off and place around uh, around your facility. The top one is just a cute little reminder for patrons um, how to, you know, what the rules are right now and, and are asked to them. And then the, the second little document is a checklist of how and what our, our, our industry is doing to keep um, people safe. We know that there are a lot of concerns and um, you know, apprehension to leave and, and eat out. And so we wanted to create something for, for our industry to use to help make people feel safe. Oh, Ken, I think you're on mute. Thanks, thanks, Samantha. I appreciate that. I was I realized I was talking to myself. Um, this question comes up a lot. What if I have a customer comes in and they don't they're not wearing a mask? This is a strong recommendation by the governor. This is not um, an instance where restaurateurs need to be the police. However, it is a very strong recommendation. Okay. So in other words, I shouldn't get in fight with the customers, but at the end of the day, it's probably good to post these signs in real visible places, right? Yeah, an extra reminder is always helpful. Okay, so I might be one that posts them on the outside of my, my restaurant as well on my inside in the lobby area 
uh, not just in the lobby area, so people can know what to expect before they walk in. Is that, would that sound fair? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Now, what about what's the actual mandate for the logs? When we think of customer safety and protections, there are customers that, you know, if some employee gets sick, they want to be informed, you know, that, you know, I, I was in your restaurant. So what's what's the rule between keeping logs for our guests now? Yeah, this is uh, originally we were mandated to keep a log and uh, patrons were mandated to give us their information for tracing. Now it is restaurants are supposed to are um, required to keep a log and then it's only voluntary if a guest provides their information. So this is something as easy as a, a guest coming in, reserving a table, you ask uh, for their information and if they'd like to provide a, a form of contact in case uh, they need to be contacted if someone um, tested positive for COVID. Okay. Okay. And then this is kind of a, an odd question that's coming up, but you know, we sometimes we have our offices. If I've got a drinking fountain in the office, should I just continue the drinking fountain? Yeah. If it is a touch drinking fountain, it, it's probably a, a very much a high touch surface. So um, if you want to come up with a procedure of sanitizing that every time someone uses it, I think continuing that use is okay. However, if that's something that you know is just not going to be feasible for your guests and your um, employees, I would recommend um, no longer using that for now. Okay. So it's been pretty clear, you know, that that I've heard that I can't use my bar seating. Can I use my dining tables in the bar? Yes. So the the goal is to um, discontinue bar like seating, so bellied up to a bar. However, all of those tables within the bar and booths are allowed to be used as dining. Okay. Okay. And then one other question on the log that I see coming up here is. Um, is the log, do I have to report that to the state? What, how long do I have to keep that? It, those that volunteer, right? Not mandatory, just those that are volunteering. Uh, what, what, what's the next step after I've collected that for the day? Uh, so originally the governor had asked for, I believe it was 14 days, but I'd have to get back and see if that data has changed. Um, I don't think it's um, a a bad idea to keep it for four, two weeks to three weeks because we know that uh, COVID symptoms um, can be underlying for, for 14 days. So if I'm keeping it for 30 days or something, I'm just being extra safe. Is, does that, is that, is that okay? Yes, absolutely. I mean, more information, the better. Uh, yeah. Okay. And what about self-service buffets and my salad bars? Can I use them? Phase two, this is not allowed, and we are um, unclear of when this will be allowed. We're hoping in phase three, but again, until we get the go-ahead from uh, the Department of Health and the governor, uh, right now it's, they're unallowed. So if you do operate a buffet-style buffet restaurant, I would suggest trying to reinvent your business model. Perhaps you do table service instead. Um, there are ways um, to use your establishment. You just cannot allow guests to serve themselves. Okay, okay. Um, so signs on floors to make sure that I've gotten six feet apart, partitions, I can be thinking about those in the back to help my cooks as well. Um, let's talk about, uh, about at the table for a second here. So I've gotten, um, you know, condiments, I've got menus. Um, it, can I use washable menus? Do they have to be disposable menus? What, what's what's now required for menus during phase two? During phase two, reusable menus are not allowed. So if you are dropping off a menu at a table, it has to be single use. However, this does not prohibit you from being creative with a chalkboard that sits in front in your lobby to ask guests to take a look before they, they are seated. It does not prohibit you from asking them, hey, we have all of our menu items online. You have a smartphone, will you check it there? Or if you have an extra uh, TV that you can program easily with the menu, that's another option. They um, are just 
trying to mitigate some of the, the extra touches. And um, this is one of the ways that they're doing it. With that being said, um, condiments that are on the table uh, can be reused and sanitized in between, which is a little bit odd, but uh, that is the guidance that we have gotten. And so one recommendation is, is maybe you don't leave the salt and pepper shakers on the table, right? You you hold those behind and you drop them off just to ensure that you are sanitizing everything that has been touched. You know, two health department guys here kind of on the side that have worked with, you know, health departments very closely. I'm sure they would love to see the fact that we have single use condiments and that's all we had during this period. The reality is an operator might be, like you just said, not have them on the table but ask that when I when I go to the table, would you like ketchup? Would you like salt and pepper, et cetera? And then bring them. And then when I leave, that's really the trigger that they're re-sanitized or even one better. Maybe I use those little souffle cups <laughs> and I bring just enough out for their, or put it onto their dish, right? I got fries, here's a little thing of ketchup, right? That type of, of thing, which a lot of us have, have done that at one time or another in the past anyway. Um, menus. Now you talk about menus. I'm as an operator, and this comes up a lot. This even has come up as a question in in this uh, um, uh, webinar, as well as others, uh, as as well as our our, our other one, which was uh, reengineering uh, webinars. Which you can go back on the hub at you know hub.wahospitality.org, and you can, if you need to redo your menus, take a look at that first before you redo it. Because here's one of the thoughts. If I'm at 50% capacity, do I really want to have all that inventory in the back? I might have less employees as well. So at the end of the day, I probably should look at phasing this in, my menu in, just kind of like the phase two. You know, if it's 50%, maybe I should have 50% of my menu, you know, my core items. Um, and not, not printing a six-page menu like I would normally have when I, you know, before I shut down four weeks ago. So those are thoughts to, to, to think about as well. Um, how about how about the clean and disinfecting touch points? Um, Samantha, what's your suggestions there? Uh, you know, we have CDC guidance on how to sanitize properly. I think this is just something that uh, should be noted by operators. So any uh, pens that that guests are using to sign credit card receipts any any touch points that you have that uh, the the credit card machines that come to the table those all need to be sanitized in between guests okay so so the question on the menu just came up i just saw it pop up about you know do we have to use our full menu all the time or not my understanding is there's no regulation on menus with the exception of we, when the menu we hand has to be a single use disposable menu. So I can print that up on paper, but outside of that, there's no other requirements. Is that correct? I'm sorry, say that again. So outside of the fact that the, the only requirement in menus that are coming out is that they are disposable single use. Outside of that, as far as whether I wanna have my full menu or a partial menu, there is no direction cover, coming from uh, the no. governor at, 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 in that aspect. Is that no. correct? Yep, absolutely. Okay. 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 Here's a, a question that's coming up. Um, we have a bar. Uh, we have a bar in one room, family dining in another. Can we have patrons sit? Uh, can we have patrons sit in the bar space uh, for dining during phase two? Or can we only seat the family dining room during phase two? So I don't know that the question's 100% clear, but if I have if I have dining in there, in other words, outside of the bar, in my bar room, I could serve food there, but not at the bar itself, correct? Uh, so I think it's just, uh, so to be clear, so a bar in a lot of operators' mind is what you have your liquor license as. And so one thing just to be clear is your bar area is one thing, the bar top is another. So just because you have booths and table that are 21 and over, you can use those still if you can seat people within like with a six uh, six feet separation. However, the bar top is not allowed. 
Okay, so I can use my bar room, so to speak, as long as the non-bar section at the bar itself is set up for, for dining and I maintain my social distancing. Um, what do you do if you have large, uh, large establishments that have a lot of team members starting at the same time? And what if staggering shifts isn't an option based on business needs? I'm not sure what the question is there. I mean, you still need to have social distancing. That really wouldn't change. I, I don't think that's any different than if you are on a Friday night and all your employees are there and, uh, and you're servicing. You're still going to have to keep social distancing between all your employees. Is that not correct? It seems about right. I mean, there's, yeah, there's going to be those right. times where you just have to follow the social distancing and adjust. And this might be where the menu and the back of house configuration is going to be your best ally. Okay. Samantha, I have a tough one. I'm going to throw you a tough one here. And I apologize, but is a sushi bar counter the same as bar seating? It is bar like seating in in that case it's our understanding in the department of health's uh interpretation that that is not allowed in phase two okay so even if i sat every other one the bottom line is if i have a sushi bar i i it's a bar i should not be i should yeah. not be seating that area correct yeah i think i think the important thing to take away from this is the bar in the governor's eyes and in his staff's idea was to prohibit people to belly up shoulder to shoulder. And so that's why anything along a counter space like that will not be allowed. In our industry, we know that uh, that really pertains to alcohol sales, but anything that you are on a, a counter like surface, like a bar top um, is not allowed in phase two. And, All right. And, and so, what DOH is uh, definitely um, is looking at. And one thing I just wanted to note for folks is that we worked with the Department of Health on this checklist. However, local health jurisdictions may send you an additional copy of something that they may want you to look at. And so, I would um, go through our checklist as you reopen, and then just touch base with your inspector, check in with them and ask if there's anything else that you may need to be doing to ensure that you are um, up to snuff with your local health department. It's always good to have that uh, communication and I would encourage it. Okay, so one, go to the website, download the checklist. You, you could, uh, so go to hub.wahospitality.org, type in uh, reopen or reopening You'll get two things. You will get the COVID, uh, the COVID-19 food establishment phase two uh, reopening checklist. And you'll also get the, uh, what's it, stay ready? What's the, the second one? Um, ready to serve. Ready to serve. Sorry about that. Uh, so either one of those have that ready to serve has actually got a lot of information in it, not just the checklist, but the checklist is also part of that. Uh, Samantha, are we also sending participants out? on uh, on this webinar the checklist tomorrow i see that yeah we're we're sending so uh the group of things that i have um prepared for everyone will be it will be the checklist you'll get um, a copy of our or a link to the hub so you can go see all of our resources as well as the i think the pre-opening uh plan that we've provided and all of the pdfs um that that you can print out and place in your establishment as well as a social media uh, graphic to let people know that you're ready, ready to serve them. That, that's a great resource. And then as we go into phase three, will you be updating that information? All of these documents are always ongoing and being updated. You know, guys, I can't thank you. Um, I mean, this has been fantastic and I'm sure our members greatly appreciate that. Um, there's a webcast on this that will be uploaded uh, tomorrow in case you weren't able to see it all or in case you came in kind of later or just want to use it as far as where those resources are. Uh, Samantha, Mike, Todd, thank you very much for being on today. Greatly appreciate it. Uh, we'll have one a week from tomorrow on Wednesday for marketing. Uh, for those that want a, uh, a, a cost-free-based a, a cost 
uh, free based, <laughs> a, a low cost marketing to reopen. Basically, where it's a, a a lot of focus on on inexpensive stuff. Uh, to get your your to get your your clientele built back up, but thank the, let me thank the three of you very much for being on and uh, appreciate your time. And everyone, don't forget the hub dot dot org for the resources that Samantha was talking about. And if not, you're going to be getting a, uh, an email from Samantha here tomorrow, anyways. That'll that'll provide you the link. So thank you all very much. Have a great day.